Welcome back everyone, Jake here. In this video, we're going to investigate the claims that a man by the name of Bob Lazar has invented a car that can run on water. Now if you want a car that runs on water, this is actually very easy. Just add a water tank to your car, put some coal underneath it, light it on fire, create steam, use steam to drive the pistons. Of course, I'm joking, please don't do this to your vehicle. But this is a really interesting science fiction idea that's been around a long time. That water itself should be and can be a fuel source for society. The godfather of science fiction writing, Jules Verne, he actually wrote in 1875 when he published The Mysterious Island. I just want to read this paragraph for you guys. This is from chapter 11. And what will they burn instead of coal? Water, replied Harding. Water, cried Pencroft, water as fuel for steamers and engines. Water to heat water? Yes, but water decomposed into its primitive elements, replied Cyrus Harding, and decomposed doubtless by electricity, which will then have become a powerful and manageable force for all great discoveries by some inexplicable laws appear to agree and become complete at the same time. Yes, my friends, I believe that water will one day be employed as fuel, that hydrogen and oxygen will constitute it, used singly or together, will furnish an inexhaustible source of heat and light, of an intensity of which coal is not capable. So a really interesting science fiction idea that's been around a really long time. So this brings us to Bob Lazar and the Corvette that allegedly he's converted himself to being capable of running on water. He's given interviews and let people examine the car. In this video, I'm going to do my best to explain how is this possible. But first, we have to briefly talk about Bob Lazar. And I'm just going to read the first paragraph on his Wikipedia page for you. Robert Scott Lazar is an American conspiracy theorist who claims to have been hired in the late 1980s to reverse engineer extraterrestrial technology at what he described as a secret site called S4. Lazar alleges that this subsidiary installation is located several kilometers south of the U.S. Air Force facility, popularly known as Area 51. If you want to learn more about Bob Lazar, you can watch the documentary about him on Netflix titled Bob Lazar, Area 51, and Flying Saucers. But I actually think the Joe Rogan podcast where he appeared is a much better information source about his story and his claims. It has tens of millions of views. Might be worth checking out. So in this video, we're going to push aside all the UFO stuff and just focus on the water car. And even though Bob Lazar's credentials are questionable, there's no doubt he's a highly intelligent person who has focused on engineering, chemistry, and physics his whole life. In 1977, Bob Lazar was the third man to power his bike with a G8220 jet engine capable of reaching a speed of 57 miles per hour. In the early 1980s, when he was working at Los Alamos Labs, he put a jet engine in his Honda car. This was a jet Honda capable of going 200 miles per hour. The local papers in Los Alamos uh, covered it at the time. So this Corvette that he converted uh, using a power source, first thing I have to tell you is it's not a water car. It even says here on the door, powered by hydrogen. So it's not powered by water, it's powered by hydrogen. Hydrogen is in these tanks in the back of his Corvette. Now I've seen the other videos on YouTube of guys putting pickle jars full of water and baking soda in their engines claiming their cars now run on water. I would be highly skeptical of these videos, guys, and definitely don't purchase any kits from them. These cars, in my opinion, don't obey the laws of thermodynamics. And before we talk about Bob's uh, hydrogen-powered vehicle, I want to first clear up some confusion of what is a hydrogen fuel cell electric vehicle. These already exist. If you want to buy one, you can buy one today. Toyota uh, puts out the Mirai. You can get the 2022 version for $50,000. Comes in five different colors. So what is a hydrogen fuel cell and how does this work? Basically, you fill up your car with hydrogen fuel or hydrogen gas. Inside the fuel cells, uh, the hydrogen gas is 
ionized and separated. And then uh, hydrogen gas, when it's ionized, it's basically just a proton. And the proton is pushed through this electrolyte membrane and stripped of its electron. The free flow of electrons is what gives your electric car, the electric motor in your car, uh, power. And then on the other side, uh, oxygen from just the atmosphere is brought into the vehicle. It attracts these hydrogen ions. They come together, they, they reclaim their electrons, and then exhaust from the vehicle is just heat and water. So hydrogen fuel cells, <clears throat> because their only exhaust is water, these are marketed as green vehicles or green technology. But there's a problem. And the problem is, is that this is an electric vehicle that requires electricity to run. And the entire process of getting hydrogen into your car is very energy inefficient. If we have energy companies producing electricity, that electricity is then used to create hydrogen gas, which is transported, stored, and then put at basically refueling pumps for your car. You're then putting the hydrogen in your car just to convert it back into electricity so the electric motor in your electric vehicle can run. Once again, this is a very inefficient process where energy is lost along the way. And we already have a better version of this, a better electric vehicle. Just think about it. If the electric company can make electricity for you, you can then plug your car in and charge batteries that stores that electricity, then you're not wasting time and energy converting it into hydrogen just to convert it back into electricity. So unfortunately, the hydrogen fuel cell just isn't competitive with lithium battery technology like we have with companies like Tesla. So we've established that Bob's Corvette does not run on water and it does not run on hydrogen fuel cell technology. This is actually hydrogen gas in these tanks. So how do we accumulate lots of hydrogen gas? And when we go to the periodic table of elements, hydrogen is the most abundant element in the universe. And it likes pairing up with oxygen because oxygen has six electrons in its outermost shell. If it can just get two more electrons, it can be a happy molecule. And when one oxygen atom gets together with two hydrogen atoms, we form H2O. And 75% of the Earth's uh, surface is covered in this stuff, so this seems like an abundant source to acquire lots of hydrogen. So potentially water is a good source to accumulate a lot of hydrogen gas, but before I explain how to do that, let's briefly talk about the internal combustion engine. Unless you're driving an electric vehicle today, this is how your car gets power. There are four stages, the intake, compression, power, and exhaust. Your fuel injector will inject a small amount of gasoline through the intake valve of a piston into the combustion chamber. The valves are closed and a spark plug will fire, igniting the gasoline. The uh, gasoline will then heat up and expand, driving the pistons, giving your engine power. The exhaust valve will open and release uh, the gases, and then this process is repeated over and over quite quickly. And this only works because hydrocarbons, gasoline, is combustible. There is a chemical reaction occurring when you ignite it. So, is there an alternative fuel source to hydrocarbons that we can use that is also combustible? And yes, there is. Hydrogen gas. Just think of the Hindenburg disaster, guys. Uh, blimps and dirigibles today have to use helium gas because hydrogen gas is highly combustible. So what if we took our existing cars and stopped using gasoline and instead figured out how to inject hydrogen gas into the combustion chamber? The spark plug would fire, the hydrogen gas would ignite, it would drive the piston. This is what I think is happening in Bob's uh, hydrogen-powered car. It's a hydrogen gas-powered car using an internal combustion engine. That's pretty neat. So in Bob's Corvette, he's storing hydrogen gas in these tanks and then feeding it into the original internal combustion engine of his car. I'm sure he's made lots of uh, modifications to make this safe, but let's now tackle the problem of how do we get a lot of hydrogen gas? If we want to convert your car, my car, from gasoline to hydrogen gas as a fuel source, 
how do we get a lot of it? And this is where we run into the problem with the law of conservation of energy. The law of conservation of energy states that energy can neither be created nor destroyed, only converted from one form to another. So if you want to create a lot of hydrogen gas, you can do this through the process of electrolysis. And you can do this at home. If you want to buy a Hoffman apparatus off Amazon, you can do that. And all you have to do is run a current through water. And you have two conductors. You might want to use platinum because it is uh, anti-corrosive. But basically, when you run a current through water, uh, the, the bonds, the covalent bonds of H2O will be momentarily broken. And if a hydrogen atom finds another hydrogen atom during this process, they can pair together, form hydrogen gas, and rise to the top. Same thing is happening over here. If a oxygen atom finds another oxygen atom, they'll come together, form O2 gas, and start piling up over here. Obviously, there's twice as many hydrogen atoms in H2O as oxygen, so the hydrogen side will fill up faster. And the problem is energy in equals energy out. It requires a lot of energy to break those covalent bonds in water in order to make hydrogen gas. And the reason why hydrocarbons, or gasoline specifically, is so energy efficient to propel all of our cars is because we didn't make it. We dug it out of the ground. Uh, the Earth uh, basically burying organic matter hundreds of millions of years ago, heat and pressure, that is how all of these, uh, these chemical bonds were formed over time. Yes, it is energy intensive to dig it out of the ground, refine it, uh, transport it, and then put it at gas stations, but still, it's, it's energy more efficient to use hydrocarbons than it is to make all the hydrogen gas that would be required to convert all of our vehicles. So we can't really call this a green technology if it requires a tremendous amount of energy in order to make all of this hydrogen gas. Obviously, the problem with using a lot of energy is a majority of our energy still comes from burning fossil fuels, coal and natural gas. And Bob Lazar does talk about this. He addresses this concern. And he says on his home he has solar panels and that all of the energy he uses in order to make his own hydrogen comes from renewable energy. Therefore, his vehicle is a sustainable green technology. The Hoffman apparatus is too slow, so of course at home, Bob Lazar has an industrial hydrogen generator. He has this machine plugged into his solar panels for power. He feeds water into it, and it creates and collects the hydrogen gas, the oxygen gas he doesn't have a use for, so that just gets vented into the atmosphere. So let's assume that the energy problem can be solved. It's not too intensive. We can use renewable sources to create the necessary hydrogen gas. What's the problem? Why isn't this being commercially applied and all of our gasoline-powered cars are being converted to hydrogen-powered cars? And Bob says the problem is, is that we need something called lithium-6 deuteride, and the government has banned it. The reason why no automotive company has pursued hydrogen gas-powered vehicles is because lithium is restricted by the government. So let's go on the Wikipedia page for lithium hydride, and lithium hydride is an inorganic compound with the formula LIH. And lithium on the periodic table of elements is right below hydrogen. It's number three. And basically it has an extra electron that it wants to give up, uh, and it's willing to do that by bonding with hydrogen. So when you go under applications for the page on lithium hydride, it talks about hydrogen storage and fuel. With a hydrogen content in proportion to its mass three times that of sodium, LIH has the highest hydrogen content of any hydride. LIH is periodically of interest for hydrogen storage, but applications have been thwarted by its stability to decomposition. Thus, removal of H2 requires temperatures above 700 degrees Celsius used for its synthesis. Such temperatures are expensive to create and maintain. The compound was once tested in a model rocket. And when you scroll down under nuclear chemistry and physics, it says the corresponding lithium-6 deuteride 
is the primary fusion fuel in thermonuclear weapons. In hydrogen warheads of the Teller Ulam design, a nuclear fission trigger explodes to heat and compress the lithium-6 deuteride and to bombard it with uh, neutrons to produce 3H, uh, so that's the isotope uh, tritium, in an exothermic reaction. The deuterium and tritium then fuse to produce helium, one neutron and a bunch of energy and, and, and stuff is released basically. Helium is the byproduct. So Bob is arguing that the reason why we don't have hydrogen gas powered internal combustion engine cars is because uh, you, need, you, need, you need a lot of lithium and specifically uh, a specific isotope of lithium to safely transport and store a lot of hydrogen gas. And the government, because this is used in weapons, the government basically doesn't allow this. You can't buy this lithium compound anywhere on the internet. It's not legal for companies to sell it commercially. So Bob says that he has his own particle accelerator and he enriches his own lithium. That's it's pretty interesting, Bob. <laughs> So in these tanks, there is uh, this compound, uh, and when the hydrogen gas is uh, refilled into the tanks, it mixes with the lithium, and it makes these tanks basically safe for storage, safe for transport. This is where Bob uh, has lost me when he explains how this car works. But basically, you know, you need to regulate the temperature in these tanks in order to get the H2 out to feed it back into the engine. But the amount of lithium in the tanks stays there. The lithium never comes out. It's just the hydrogen gas. So Bob argues that the reason why this hasn't been commercially applied, why our present you know, fleet of internal combustion engine vehicles haven't been converted to hydrogen is because of all of the lithium that would be required. And in general, the government and corporations don't want people stockpiling a combustible hydrogen gas and um, basically enriching their own lithium, which can be used in certain kinds of weapons. So that's about as much as I can explain to you guys. Definitely Bob is an interesting guy and this car he's been driving around is pretty interesting. Why this isn't more commercially available or publicly known. Once again, <clears throat> you can make certain arguments that it's not energy efficient or it's not safe to operate. I don't know. I don't, I don't have the answers. This video is just for fun, once again, to try and explain what the heck is this? How is this even possible? If you guys enjoyed this video, give me a thumbs up so the algorithm knows it's good. If you have any comments or questions or thoughts of your own, let me know down below. I love hearing from you guys. Till the next video, take care.